height of the uh, camera there. Okay. Uh, yeah, good. Okay, our blessing. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Kitchenu B'Metzvotav V'Tzivanu. La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Okay. All right. So the, the topic we're going to uh, deal with is perhaps, and the reason I chose it as the, towards the end, is the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Is what is this whole idea of the Torah commanding us to learn, to study Torah, and what does that imply? Okay, and uh, how is it really considered to be a mitzvah? We're all familiar, of course, I'm sure, with the fact that in the paragraphs of the Shema, it says, Vishinantam Levanecha, and you shall teach it unto your children. Okay. And we're going to see in a moment that that is the foundation verse, the Pasuk, that uh, the author of Sefer Al Chinuch is going to initially have us look at. But there's a lot more to it than that, and that's part of what we're going to be examining these sessions. Okay, so I'm going to go to screen share and uh, here we go. Okay, and we see that it's the precept of Torah study. Okay from Sefer HaChinuch. And uh, he tells us, first of all, at the outset, that it's a positive precept. We said that that means that Real it's... Real quick. What? The 419, is that the mitzvah number? That's the number. In other words, where the book has a number like that, good question, Ivan. It means he has listed all 613 mitzvot. And according to his count of what Rambam included in the Sefer HaMitzvot, this is number 419. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's his, uh, that's how he, right. And uh, if I play around with the page a little bit, you can see the edition that I used actually tells us what Parsha the mitzvah is in, Parsha Ve'et Hanan. So it tells us that's already towards the end of the Torah. Okay. But the fact that he tells us that it's a, whoop, there we go, a positive precept, a mitzvah asay, is important. Because again, we would ask ourselves, some of the following questions. Number one, okay, on whom does this mitzvah apply? We hope to see that shortly. Number two, if it is a positive commandment, okay, then is there any occasion that uh, it is applied from a time perspective? You know, for example, we have a commandment to shake lulav and esrog, okay? But that is time bound. So given the fact that it's time bound, it means women are exempt. Or we saw the example of mitzvah of tzitzit. There too, that was time bound and therefore women were exempt. However, if we take another example that we've looked at, we saw uh, recently the mitzvah of tzedakah. Okay? Now that has no time frame. Right? Therefore, it's a positive commandment on both men and women. Okay? So as a result, okay, we can understand that that question of to whom does it apply is going to be a, a significant question. So moving on 
as we continue in the first paragraph, but he adds something. It's not just to learn Torah, okay? And what's the purpose then? He asks of learning, uh, he tells us of learning Torah. One part is how we are to carry out the precepts. Okay? In other words, how do we fulfill the other mitzvot in the Torah? But also he says to us, to know the ordinances of the Torah in accord with the truth. But before he even gets to that, he warns us to keep away from what God has forbidden us. So the purpose, he argues, of learning Torah is number one, to know how to do mitzvot, the positive mm -hmm. commandments. Number two, to also learn those mitzvot that are what we call lo ta'aseh, love, the prohibitions in the Torah, because those are the things Hashem does not want us to do. Okay? And therefore, ultimately, to understand, as he puts it, the ordinances of the Torah are in accord with truth. Now that we'll have to try to clarify. So we're seeing number one, we need to learn Torah for at least two reasons. But then he cites, we said that verse from the Shema, the Shinantam Levanecha, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. So that would seem to tell me that the mitzvah that each of us have in learning Torah is both to learn and to transmit, to pass that learning on to others. So it's sort of a dual requirement. Okay? But what, do we mean only our own children? He now tells us there is a Midrash, okay? From what's called Midrash Sifre, which is a halachic Midrash. Remember, there are some books of Midrash that are more what they call Agada, okay? Uh, story, legend, uh, lore, L-O-R-E. And there are other Mid books of Midrash that are clearly just legal variety. So he tells us when you look in that book on this verse, it says to us, Levanecha, teach it to your children. Elu Talmidecha, these are your students. Lechena Tamotse, Bekomakom. And thus you find in any place, he says, in really all places, right? kruim banim, that students are often called children. And he cites two verses okay, in regards to proving that sometimes the texts in the Torah, but more so in the other parts of the Tanakh. Okay? And that's what we're going to see momentarily. Refer to these children as one's students. Okay? Hello. So let's yes. see what he points out. Your children means your pupils, your students. Earlier. And he bases that here on the fact of an example in the book of Kings, where it said, came forth the sons of the prophets. Okay? And what he means by that is that it's clearly the sons here were the students of the prophets. Okay? And so if we look at that closely, okay, he then says there's another basis for this same verse. 
teaching it diligently to children. And he cites the same midrash where it says, Vishinantam Levanecha, Sheyihiu Mechudadim Betoch Picha, Shekeshe Adam Shoelcha Davar, Lo Tehe Megam Gamebo. Okay, all right. So, okay. And yeah, that's what he says. That the words of the Torah, should be arranged in your mouth. In other words, you should be fluent, familiar with the law of the Torah. So that when a man asks you, you don't stammer, but rather answer him directly. So he gets both of those ideas of explaining why he chose this verse from the Shema as his foundation. Verse. All right, so I'm going to see you about the, let me say 10 after 6. Okay, to okay. be able to uh, tell him, tell us rather, well, number one, we you have to time. learn it. Number two, you have to. This way we arrive at the same time. And it should be familiar I enough to, to answer questions about, about it. She said, no, 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 she'll come here, they'll come here. So Torah learning then is supposed to imply that it's not something done simply for academic, in other words, for intellectual purposes, but it's for, if you will, hands-on, for doing. That's what he's telling us. Okay? Let's go now to the next part. Okay? In order to clarify that idea of learning for the sake of teaching and for the sake of doing, <clears throat> we see that he's going to cite some other psukim, some other verses. Okay. One of them, okay, we're going to look, we're going to look at these two in a little bit more detail, okay? One from Dvarim chapter 5, verse 1. Okay, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and observe to do them. So that verse, okay, as he shows us, here it says, learn them and take care to do them. So again, it connects the idea of learning and doing. And his second selection, okay, which again is from Devarim, this time chapter 31, says as follows. Assemble the people, and the men and the women and the little ones, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. So again, his additional verses make this and strengthen his argument <clears throat> that the purpose of learning Torah is not simply intellectual benefit, but to learn what to do, how to do, when to do the mitzvot. Now, let's go on a little bit, okay? He still, however, hasn't answered our question <clears throat> of to whom it's required, right? And so let's see if he proceeds to do that when he gives his explanation of the verse. The root reason for this precept is known. In other words, he says, he claims it's obvious. For by learning, a man will know the ways of the eternal Lord, be he be blessed. While without it, he will neither know <clears throat> nor understand and will be reckoned as an animal. So what is his uh, argument here? Is that 
among these verses, there's a common factor. We said that learning leads to doing. If that's the case, what is the difference between an animal and a person? After all, animals can learn things, right? We teach dogs tricks, okay? And not just dogs. Other animals can be taught, all right? To do certain behaviors. <clears throat> but what he wants us to understand is that it's one thing to learn it. It's another thing to apply it to carry it out, right? And that's what he wants to emphasize here, okay? <clears throat> that one knows what Hashem expects of us because he knows that our learning will lead to behaving, to doing, okay? Now, let's continue. So what else does he want us here to consider, okay? The laws of the precept, right? For example, if we're expected to learn, at what age do you learn? At what age do you teach? Okay. And so he cites, gives us an example, okay, that I'm going to share with us from the Talmud. This comes, and then we'll look at it here in the story, he raises the question, from what time is a father to start teaching his son Torah? So if we find the example in Gemara, in the Talmud Sukkah, says the following, the rabbis taught, a minor who knows how to wave the lulav is obligated in the mitzvah of lulav. If he knows how to wrap himself with a talus, he is obligated in the mitzvah of tzitzis. If he knows how to guard his body to keep himself clean and therefore can put on tefillin, his father needs to buy him tefillin. If the child knows how to talk, says the Gemara, his father teaches him Torah and the recitation of the Shema. What is meant here by Torah? And Rav Hamnuna suggests the following verse. Torah tziva lanu Moshe morasha kihilat Yaakov that the father should teach his young child this verse, that the Torah that Moses commanded us is the heritage of the Jewish people. And what about Kriyat Shema? How much of the Shema? We should teach him the first verse. So here our author is going to tell us specifically those examples. All right, let's just, right? That Moses commanded us the Torah and the first verse of Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Okay. Now, at what age do we think a child is uh, suitable, let's say, for that kind of a lesson, okay? To be able to memorize uh, a verse like that. Four, five, six. So again, he wants to tell us if, till he is a lad of six or seven when he is to take him to children's teachers. So before that age, as a toddler, he should begin to teach him certain things. And once he reaches six or seven, if you would, that's as if it's the age to begin what we would call what, elementary school, preschool, something like that. 
What's interesting, he takes this all again from the Talmud. And in Baba Batra, in the Talmud, we see an interesting story that gives us the background of how Jewish education, Torah education, really began. Okay. And he tells us it's from the time of the regulation, says the Talmud, of Joshua ben Gamla. Why? Because Rabbi Judah says, Joshua ben Gamla, were it not for him, the Torah would have been forgotten. For at first, if a child had a father, says the Talmud, his father taught him. If he had no father, he did not learn at all. But then he pointed to the verse that we're using as our foundation verse. And it says, and you shall teach it. Namely, that there should be teachers appointed. And so the Talmud says where? It started first in Jerusalem. Because we have again a verse that tells us, Ki mitzion teitzei Torah. Out of Zion shall come forth the Torah. And therefore, that was the first place where schools were established. So the father would then be expected to take him up to Jerusalem to learn. Hmm. But again, Rabbi Joshua ben Gamla saw that that was problematic. Because the question was, fathers sometimes did not bring their boys up till much later till 16 or 17. And so therefore, he established various, what we would call districts, and that there should be teachers for elementary students in each district. Okay. So we see here, again, in our text that he discusses this, right? But what about if the child is very young? Let's say, really early education. Yes, okay. He, he raises the question whether that's appropriate. It would be right for every person of sense to take heed not to overburden the child with study while he is yet tender of limb and tender of heart. In other words, there can be a point where we feel it's too early to start a child. You have to be sensitive to the needs of the child, and what the child is capable of. Okay. And so therefore he suggests, that's why he suggests the age of six or seven, okay? It's after his energy grows strong and his eyes are alight to hearken with understanding to the voice of his teacher. So in other words, it has to be an age that a child is appropriate. Okay. And then he points out the following. Then you bring him under the yoke of the Torah. That's when you start to teach the child on a regular basis. Okay. And let him be given of its spiced wine to drink and of its honey to eat. Now, where does he get that idea? Again, the Talmud tells us a story where it says that when a child would begin school, they would either give them candy the first few days or they would give them a slate, you know, and the slate, uh, for example, would be like uh, something with chalk that we would write on, but you smear honey on the slate. Let the child lick it off. So the idea is you would reward the child at the very outset to make them identify the act of learning as something sweet, as something worthwhile, worth doing. So the idea of, let's say, rewarding 
children and what in their learning really dates back many, many years. Okay. So having given us this idea as to what age a child starts to learn, okay, we can see here that uh, another question would come up. Namely, what? what's the content of a child's learning? Or what is the content of an adult learning? What subjects should a person learn? Okay. How much time should they spend on certain subjects? Okay. So he wants to address that here in this next paragraph. There is likewise in the subject matter of the precept, what the sages said. So again, he wants us to basically uh, suggest that the Talmud gives us a long story here, okay, as to what could be learned. And here's the Gemara section to what he's referring to. To what extent is a man obligated to teach his son Torah? Rabbi Judah said in the name of Samuel, Zebulun okay, taught Bible, Mishnah, Talmud, Halachot, and Agadot. But an objection was raised. If his father taught him Bible, why have to teach him Mishnah? So again, another rabbi raised a question. If his father taught him one subject, what about his grandfather teaching him another subject? So the Gemara asks, is the grandfather under any obligation? After all, the verse says, Vishinantam levanecha. You shall teach it to your sons, not necessarily your son's sons. Right? No. But then one of the rabbis answers, he who teaches his grandson Torah, scripture ascribes it to him as if he received it directly from Mount Sinai. Because a verse in the Torah says, and you shall make them known to your sons and your sons' sons. So did the rabbis come then to a final conclusion? That's what this discussion in this section here is. Okay. And down over here as well. So the answer that he came to was that the following. You should divide the study into three parts. One part is Mikra, in other words, Bible. Another part is Mishnah. And the third part is Talmud. Okay. Now, we need to understand, of course, one important component here. When they say Bible, right, they don't just mean Torah. They mean the books of the prophets and other books in the writing section. The entire, what we call Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Okay. When they say Mishnah, their view was the text that we have more or less as a Mishnah and to do it by repetition, almost by rote. But when they're referring to Talmud, they want to understand the logic and the explanation okay, as to how you get from the text of the Bible and the Mishnah and then how it applies to daily life. And that is how the Talmud basically became the kind of text that it was questions and answers on the application of how to apply the Torah's uh, mandates. 
Okay, so having pointed that out to us, right? He then wants us to clarify that while the primary obligation is on the father, for the grandfather to teach, as we saw, was advantageous as well. But we might ask the next question. Fine, we know to whom we have to teach, okay? To our progeny, to our children. How long do I, as an individual, need to make the effort to study Torah? What happens if I'm uh, working? Do I need to make time to study Torah? What happens if I'm a, a poor beggar and I have to uh, beg on the street to get food? Am I also expected to study Torah? Is it really a mitzvah on all individuals and all men? So that's where he's beginning to continue. Until when is every man duty bound to study Torah? Till the day of his death, he says. In other words, we study, continue Torah, study throughout our lives, citing the verse, right? Lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And so why is that the case? Because the sages emphasize the matter by way of moral instruction and to teach human beings what is desirable. So it's clear, says that the purpose of Torah study then, okay, continues throughout our life okay, so that we know how to live what Hashem expects of us and what to do. Okay. Now, in a sense, uh, we still have our, one of our initial questions. Who is required to study Torah? Okay. And this is where he cites our, an example. He tells us every single Jew has the duty of Torah study, the poor as well as the rich. Okay. And so how do we know that? What's his basis? Namely from a section again in the Talmud. And it's an interesting story. And I'm going to share it with you at this point because it's one of the stories that many of us are familiar with about the famous sage Hillel. And, it, and in, it's in this context that that story is presented. Okay. So here's the story. This is from uh, the Talmud uh, section Yoma. Our rabbis taught the poor, the rich, and the person who is uh, focused on material things in life all came before a heavenly court. They said to the poor man, why have you not occupied yourself with Torah? If he says I was poor and worried about my sustenance, they would say to him, were you poorer than Hillel? It was reported about Hillel the elder that every day he used to work and, one, and earn one coin, half of which he would give to the guard at the house of learning, the other half spent for his food. One day he found nothing to earn and the guard at the house of learning would not permit him to enter. <clears throat> Excuse me. He climbed up and sat upon the window to hear the words from the mouths of the teachers, Shmaya and Avtalion. They say, 
That day was the eve of Shabbos in the winter, and snow fell. When the dawn arose, Shemaiah said to Talion, <clears throat> This house is very light, usually. How come today it's so dark? Perhaps it's a cloudy day. They looked up and saw the figure of a man in the window. They went up and found him covered by snow. They removed him, bathed him, anointed him, and therefore turns out that uh, that day was also the Sabbath, and therefore they profaned the Sabbath to save his life. That was the importance, it seemed, of Torah study. Then one would turn to the rich man and ask, why have you not occupied yourself with the Torah? If he said, I was rich, <coughs> me, and I occupied myself with my possessions, they would say to him, were you perhaps richer than Rabbi Elazar ben Kharsum? After all, his father left him numerous cities and numerous boats. He was a great merchant and he would travel from one city to the next city to check on his produce and his storehouses. And each time he traveled, he would bring a sack of flour along with him. Why? Because that would provide him food to study Torah. One day, they said, they wanted to make him a public official. And he responded to them, I beg of you, let me go to study Torah. We shall not let you go, they said. What did he do? He sold off much of his property and his ships to pay a bribe <clears throat> to these officials. So he instead, he could study Torah. And final, then the final story here, to the person who was so concerned only with their physical well-being, if they said, if he said, well, I was beautiful, said, and I was busy with my personal life, the rabbis would say to him, were you more beautiful than Joseph? It was told of Joseph that the wife of Potiphar every day endeavored to entice him with words. She put one set of garments on in the morning for him and did then a different set of garments on in the evening for him, each time saying, yield to me. And he responded, no. I'll have you in prison, she said. And his answer was, the Lord releases those in prison. I will punish you, she said. And he again responded, no. I will blind your eyes, she said. And he responded, but the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. She offered him money, but he would not listen to her. Thus, we see the example of Hillel, the example of Rabbi Eliezer, and the example of Joseph. So from that story, we begin to see the episode comes to tell us that that is why it's very clear, okay, that uh, a person is to study throughout their life, regardless of whether they're poor or rich, healthy or uh, afflicted, things of that nature. Okay? So as we, as we begin to finish up just for today, and we'll continue with this topic next week, I just want to point out part of that they base on the verse from Joshua, Vahagita bo yomam velayla, and you shall meditate upon the Torah day and night. Okay. So next time we'll pick up then with the question of on what basis is it that they established schools in communities 
and on what basis is it that it appears where who is actually required to learn Torah, right? So thank you for your participation today and everybody stay well and take care.